At first blush, the lessons for today might seem a bit disjointed and a little unrelated to one another, and so they are. But there's some reasons behind that, and they're not necessarily all that far apart. We could begin with the Gospel lesson, because if you look at the reference for the Gospel lesson, you'll see that there are two parts and a big chunk missing in the middle. A whole lot of verses are, like, not there. And I would suggest that it's kind of like having two bookends, because each of these little chunks of the Gospel are at either end of a story. Now, that story is the feeding of the multitude. And there's a reason why the editors of the lectionary left that out. And the reason being that beginning next week, we have an extended reflection on the sixth chapter of John. And the sixth chapter of John is a very, very long reflection of the apostle on that very reality, the feeding of the multitude but in a whole different light. And so, as this gospel lesson happens to come just before that, the editors decided to take out the feeding of the multitude and leave it for next week. So, it seems like there's a story missing. There's a piece of the story missing here somewhere. And so it is. Now you know what it is. But you know what that story is, so we can fill it in in our mind's eye. But I do want to talk about those two pieces, which are the bookends that are left for us to consider today. The first one is Jesus and the disciples, those first apostles. As Mark tells the story, they have been on mission. They've been out and about teaching. They've been out and about doing marvelous things, much of which had to do with healing. Now, a few weeks ago, we heard the story of the woman who had been sick for 12 long years and how she pushed the crowd away and she wanted to touch Jesus. And as she touched Jesus, Mark tells us, and Jesus felt power going out of him. And even then, if you recall, we talked about how working with folks who are not well on a basis, trying to bring them some peace and some wholeness, that's hard work, and it can take a lot out of you. You can be exhausted, particularly if you've been doing this for a while. And so Jesus knows that about himself, and he sent these disciples out on mission, and now they're coming back, and they're joyful because they're saying, we were able to teach them such marvelous things that you taught us, and we were able to do these great works just like you do. But Jesus also knew that they were pretty much depleted of any kind of real energy. And so he says, come apart with me. Let's go off to a deserted place by ourselves. And that's instructive to us because it, again, reaffirms and repeats something that we need to get clear for ourselves, particularly those of us who are busy about many things in the ministry and the mission of the church or doing churchly kinds of things out in the world, like these disciples. That that work, particularly when we're dealing with people who are in need, can be draining. It can take a lot out of you. And so Jesus is giving us some counsel here. He's telling us that if you're doing these things and you're starting to feel a little depleted, then you need to come away to a quiet place. Now, as I scan the room, most of us in this room probably remember the, the name we used to give what we now call a gas station. We used to call them filling stations. At least I did when I was growing up. It's where you went to fill up your car with fuel. And so what Jesus is really saying is you need to be refilled. He's telling his apostles, his disciples, you need to come away with me to the filling station. But what we're, not, what we're getting filled up with is not gasoline or snacks. It's the word of God. It is the spirit of God. And that takes a little time. 
And it needs to be done in a quiet way so that we can retool ourselves and refit or refill ourselves with this marvelous power that is our, at our disposal, at our discretion, because the Spirit is upon us. But we need to fill ourselves up with it. And so Jesus says, come away to a deserted place. Well, as typical in the Gospel, Jesus tries to get away. He does this alone a lot. This time he's taking his disciples with him, but no matter when Jesus tries to do it, the crowds follow him. This charismatic young preacher has something to say that people want to hear, but also he has the power to bring healing, to bring wholeness. We've seen that already over and over again. And so that's something that we need to take with us. That if we start to feel depleted, if we start to feel tired of doing the right thing, if we start to feel tired of living out this Christian way, this Christian life, then maybe it's a sign. Maybe it's a sign that we need to come apart, get away to a deserted place, to a quiet place, and allow God to fill us up again. The way the gospel has been printed in your, in, your, in your bulletin, I believe, there's a little space between these two pieces of the gospel. And the second part is actually after the feeding of the 5,000. So if it took a lot of energy to do all these other things, I'm sure it took a lot of energy to 5,000 people. Anybody who's fed a couple hundred here in our parish auditorium knows all the work that goes into that. And so Jesus... And his disciples, again, they're mostly fishermen, so they know how to use this. They get into the boat, and they go for a leisurely boat ride somewhere, trying to fill themselves up again. And they moor in at Gennesaret, we're told. Now, something about Gennesaret that you probably don't know, you may, but I'm presuming that you don't, because it's not there in the Gospel lesson, but Gennesaret is in a region where there are a lot of hot springs. Now, on a hot day like today, a hot spring doesn't sound very inviting. However, we all, or ma many of us, have maybe have experienced the, the relief that could come when we have some sort of muscular or bone pain, like arthritis or something, and going into a hot bath, particularly one that has minerals in it, like Epsom salts and things like that, and then especially if the water is bubbling and moving. A lot of people pay a lot of money for a hot tub. And that's why, because it's just so nice. And so when people had these chronic illnesses, going into the hot springs often brought relief. And so there were a lot of people there on their way to these hot springs. You may remember in history that President Roosevelt, because of his polio, used to go to Hot Springs, Georgia. And actually, he helped them build that up into a place of respite and relief, particularly for folks suffering from that, that ailment. And it brought great relief to them. So it's not a surprise that if Jesus and his entourage get off at Gennesaret, this region where all these hot springs are, that there wouldn't be a lot of sick people already there. But you see, they've been there before, some of them, and they probably said, okay, well, I feel better when I'm in the water, but when I get out, well, it all starts all over again. But they've heard about this preacher, they've heard about this healer, and that he brings wholeness and, and healing. But they wouldn't have to keep going back to this place. And so they kind of forget about the hot springs and they start following them to wherever he may be, whether it's in the marketplace in town or in the village or even on a farm someplace. They just all go to where he is. Because they're looking for something. They're looking for that compassionate touch of Jesus that can bring relief whether it is physical or mental or spiritual. Just touching Jesus 
gives relief. The woman who was sick for 12 years that we heard a couple of weeks ago, she understood that and nothing was going to stand in her way, as you recall. And it's interesting that Mark uses the same phrase today. All they wanted to do was to touch the hem of his garment. But that was enough. They didn't need Jesus' full attention. They didn't need to kind of wave their hands in front of him and say, See me, I need your help. They knew that the compassion that Jesus exercised in one sense just oozed out of him and that merely being in his presence was enough. And if they could just touch the hem of his garment, just get close enough to do that, that somehow they would feel better. And so they did. They pressed in on him and the disciples. The disciples had been healing, so they were probably part of this whole scene too. So, again, we hear about this compassion of Jesus. The same compassion that in the earlier part said, he looked at the crowd and they were like sheep without a shepherd. But in that marvelous psalm that we so often associate with funerals, unfortunately, Psalm 23 is not only for the dead, it's for the living more. Because it is the guidance and the compassion of the shepherd. God, who is constantly with us, constantly guarding over us, constantly ready to do whatever is necessary for us to drink of life and drink of it fully so that we might dwell in his courts forever. And then we have the epistle. There we go, a little shift. And it doesn't make much sense to most of us. All this talk about the circumcised and the uncircumcised and one's done by human hands and blah, 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 blah. And that's typical Paul. Paul probably didn't write Ephesians, but somebody related to Paul somehow, a student or someone very close to him did. And so it's very much Paul's language and Paul's way of talking, these run-on sentences that seem to go on forever and need a bit of interpretation. But the core of it is this. And the hymn that was chosen for today, for the sequence hymn, that nails it. In Christ, there is no division. In Christ, there is no separating people out. That was the problem in the early church. The biggest argument the early church had was who's in and who's out. Those early, early disciples, because they had been Jewish, they were children of Abraham, they had all been circumcised, as it were, that was the sign of the covenant, that they were the ones who were chosen, and so they were the ones who inherited the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. Jesus belonged to them. And St. Paul and those who would follow St. Paul are saying, no, 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 it's not like that at all. In fact, quite the opposite, Jesus came to undo all of that. That it didn't make any difference whether you were Jew or Gentile, slave or free, free, Hebrew or Greek, male or female. We hear this in Galatians. It didn't make any difference to Christ. That in Christ there can be no division. And yet we live in a society today that is hell-bent on dividing people. Dividing people by race and ethnicity, dividing people by cultural heritage, dividing people about political persuasions, dividing people because you have a different idea about that than I do. And because I am who I am, I'm right, especially if I have power. That is not Christian. And anything that makes the name Christian part of it is a heresy. Plain and simple. In Christ there is no division. There can be no division. If the mission of Jesus is to have any reality in our world. So we cannot countenance that division. 
we cannot be part of that dividing energy. Quite the contrary, if we would follow Jesus, if we would follow the Christ, we must be agents of reconciliation, of bringing disparate people together. That's how the world, as we know it, can change. Because the other way is the way of the world, not the way of the kingdom of God. And why? Because we hear in the gospel that Jesus looks on the people. And he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. A divided society is that kind of people. Because we cannot follow one shepherd if we are divided among ourselves. In Christ, there is but one people. In Christ, there is but one community. In Christ, there is no east or west, no north or south. There is no black or white or brown or yellow or red. In Christ, all are one. Because each and every one of us who claims Christ as Savior has the image of Christ imprinted on our own faith. That is what is the message of this epistle. That is the message of Jesus himself. That must be our message. That we, who bear the image of the Savior, on our own bodies, work for unity. Not conformity, for unity. That we, who bear the image of Christ in our hearts, speak and act in such a way that someone sees us and they say, I want more of that. But do we live that? Is that the way in which we organize our lives? Or are we more concerned with sorting out who's in and who's out, who belongs and who doesn't? National border, state boundary, none of that makes any difference to Christ. There is but one people the children of God. And we all bear that image in our hearts, in our minds, and as we pray, even in our bodies. The one way of Christ is the way of self-giving love. And that self-giving love countenances no division. So we must always be mindful, always be prepared to overcome division when we see it. It isn't enough for us to say, I don't think that way. We are called to be those disciples that go out into the world and teach and preach and heal, just like those apostles. And Jesus is ready, willing, and able to prepare us, to have us come away with him for just a bit, to learn this way. To be filled up with the power of the Spirit. To be able to heal and make whole again. Not only the suffering one who is ill, but our communities, our nation, our society, our world as well. 
we have a high calling. And that is to be Christ in the world. You have this call. You can do nothing if you divide. You can do everything in the reconciling blood of Jesus Christ. That's the challenge that these lessons give us today. Disparate though they are, seemingly unrelated and truncated as they might be. But there is a truth that runs through all of them. And it is that truth that in Christ there is no division. There is no east or west, north or south. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are all one. One faith. One baptism. One body. In Christ Jesus, our Lord.